Assalamualaikum and hi everyone. Today we're going to look at our ninth lecture, Sampling for Quantitative Research. From the last video, we know that there are many ways to collect primary data. One of the most common ways to choose respondents is via sampling. In this video, we will focus on sampling for quantitative research. Recall that the purpose of primary data collection is to identify the group of elements or subjects which embody the attributes the researcher wants to study. This group is called the population. For instance, if we want to study the characteristics of the poor, the population is all of the poor, not everyone in general. But for all practical purposes, the researcher will never be able to study all of them, so the best the researcher can do is to study a subset of this group. This subset is a sample of the population. The process of selecting the sample is called sampling. There are a number of ways to do the sampling, and we will learn all of them in the subsequent slides. How sampling is done affects the interpretation of the results. Each object selected for inclusion in the sample is called a sampling unit. So if you are interested in poor household, the sampling unit is the household. But if you are looking at poverty incidence nationwide, the sampling unit may be the district. Before beginning the selection process, we first need to determine how many sampling units to select. That is, we need to determine the sample size. Clearly, the larger the sample size, the closer it gets to the population. Because the objective of sampling is to be able to say something about the population, representativeness is the most desirable objective. It turns out that some sampling methods can ensure representativeness, while others cannot. Here is an example. In 1936, the U.S. Literary Digest took a giant sample of 10 million people and predicted that Landon would beat Roosevelt in the presidential elections. Unfortunately, the sampling frame was the telephone directory, and poorer voters had no telephone. The list from which the researcher draws the sample is called the sampling frame. The population census provides the frame for many studies. Other sampling frames include the list of manufacturing companies or names on the unemployment register. Finally, the proportion of the units in the population that is used as a sample is called the sampling fraction. Here is a visual of the important sampling concepts population, or the theoretical target group, sampling frame, or the known target population, and the selected sample. The sample size has to be determined at the outset. Two considerations are paramount. One, it must be achievable within the researcher's control, that is time, money, and manpower. And two, it must be rich enough to allow exploration of the major issues of the intended research. These considerations are contradictory, so the ultimate decision, therefore, represents a compromise. However, non-response or errors mean that the final sample will always be smaller than the selected sample size. For this reason, the researcher choose a larger sample size than what is required so that they will get the final sample size that they want. Here are examples of sample size calculations. The first is for infinite population, where the population size is more than 50,000, where you have the sample size is equivalent to the confidence level square multiplied by P, which is the percentage of population picking a choice, and multiplied by 1 minus P over the C square, where C is the confidence interval. The second formula is for finite population, where the population size is less than 50,000. Note that to calculate the sample size for a finite population, what we need to do is to calculate the sample size using the infinite population formula first. Then we use the sample size derived from the calculation to calculate the sample size for a finite population. While the ideal is to get information from the entire population, this is often impossible in practice, as some members of the population may not be accessible. For instance, for a population census, some may live in areas that are hard to reach, some may be gravely ill, and some are fugitives in hiding. Compared to a census, sampling requires only a small number of units to be selected. Hence, it uses fewer resources, that is, fewer money, manpower, and time. 
This cost saving allows collection of more detailed information as a trade-off. Sampling also takes less time to collect. In a rapidly changing environment, timeliness is important. An example is an opinion poll before an election or exit polls after one. If there is a long delay before the results are published, the information may be out of date. As another example, population censuses are conducted only once in 10 years, so we are often using population census data up to 10 years old. If interviewers or enumerators are trained well, high-quality data can be obtained. Also, more attention can be given to each unit sampled and to follow up on missing information or elaboration of data collected. More topics can be covered and in greater depth. Hence, a sample may convey more accurate data than a census. If sampling is done according to probabilistic principles, the results can be generalized. This, as indicated already, is the primary objective of sampling. Probability sampling, or sometimes called scientific sampling, involves a selection of an element on the basis of probability, specifically some form of random selection. In order to have a random selection, the researcher must set up some process or procedure that assures that the different units in the population have equal chances of being chosen. There are various forms of random selection, such as picking out a name from a hat or choosing the short straw. These days, computers are used to generate random numbers as the basis for random selection. Probability sampling is vital for quantitative research. Why is this so? The most important reason is that it ensures representativeness. If it is possible to draw a small sample that can be representative of the population, there is no need to go through the time and expense of enumerating the entire population. Since it is representative, the findings from the sample can be applied to the entire population. This allows the researcher to make generalizations. Of course, the sample cannot be 100% representative of the population, so there will be sampling error. But probability sampling allows the magnitude of this error to be estimated. Since the sample is based on random selection, one can argue that there is objectivity in the selection process. In probability sampling techniques, the researcher must guarantee that each individual has an equal opportunity or chance for selection into the sample, and this can be achieved if the researcher utilizes randomization. The advantage of using a random sample is the absence of both systematic and sampling bias. If random selection was done properly, the sample should be representative of the entire population. There are several major probability methods. Each has its own advantages and drawbacks. They are simple random sampling, systematic random sampling, stratified random sampling, and cluster sampling. Simple random sampling is called simple because all the researcher needs to do is assure that all the members of the population are included in the sampling frame and then randomly select the desired number of subjects. This method is used where the population is relatively small and the sampling frame is fairly complete. Simple random sampling ensures that the entire population is included in the sampling frame or list from which sampling is made and every element in the population has an equal and independent chance of being chosen. Sampling is done in a single stage. Independent means that the selection of one element does not affect the selection of another element. Sampling can be done with or without replacement. Sampling with replacement satisfies the equal probability assumption, but allows the same unit to be selected more than once. Whereas sampling without replacement ensures that any unit can only be selected once. However, this violates the equal probability assumption, but if the population is large enough, this violation should not be material. The general steps to conduct a simple random sampling are Make a list of the population. Assign sequential number to each member of the population. Calculate sample size. Choose sample randomly. It is important to note that random here does not mean selecting anything that comes along, like stopping people in the street or selecting haphazardly. Random means the use of things such as the lottery method, random number tables, or random number generator softwares. Let's take a look at the pros and cons of simple random sampling. 
Among the advantages of sibilant sampling is that the ease of use. The concept of this sampling method is also very easy to understand. Unlike more complicated sampling methods, such as the stratified random sampling, there is no need to divide the population into subpopulations or take any other additional steps before selecting members of the population at random. This method is also easy to operationalize, as it is usually easy to pick a smaller sample size from the existing larger population using the random number table or software. Similar random sample is meant to be an unbiased representation of a group. So it is considered a fair way to select a sample from a larger population, since every member of the population has an equal chance to be selected. From a larger population, you can also get a small sample quite quickly. However, there are also disadvantages. This method can only be used if the entire population is known and well defined. So it may be difficult to conduct if the sample is geographically dispersed. A sampling error can also occur with a simple random sample if the sample does not accurately reflect the population it is supposed to represent. For this reason, simple random sampling is more commonly used when the researcher knows little about the population. If the researcher knew more, it would be better to use a different sampling technique. Simple random sampling is not that simple. In fact, it may require quite a large sample size for all the characteristics of a population to be adequately captured. In other words, it is not the most efficient of the main sampling methods. Hence, more efficient but somewhat more complex sampling procedures are described next. Systematic random sampling is a variant of the simple random sampling, which involves choosing from a randomly selected starting point on the population list in a systematic way. The general steps to conduct a systematic random sampling is Make a list of the population and assign sequential number to each member of the population. Calculate sample size. Calculate the sampling fraction, which is taking the number of required sample size over the population size. So if the sampling fraction is k, then the researcher picks every kth element from the sampling frame. Then select the first unit randomly using either method learned in the previous slide. Say it is 3. Select the rest of your sample systematically, that is, every case member of the population starting from 3 until n units are selected. And here are the advantages and disadvantages of systematic random sampling. Among the advantages are, it is useful when sampling over a period of time is done. For instance, in a survey of customer service, the researcher may pick one in every five customers who come to the counter. It needs fewer units than simple random sampling. It is also easier to perform because all it takes is to find one random number to start with and hence the researcher gets more information per unit cost. That means it is more efficient than simple random sampling. The sampling process will also result in fewer selection errors and it tends to be more evenly spread out across a population. However, these are the disadvantages. The most important is that of systematic bias. It may not be appropriate if there is a systematic pattern in the sampling frame that renders the selection non-independent. Systematic bias may then be significant. For instance, suppose you want to select a sample of 100 students in a school, and you know that about 50% of the students are boys and the other 50% um, are girls. You know from a class list that goes boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, and so on. So if you choose a to start from the beginning and pick every fourth student in the list for a 25% sample, you will end up with only girls in your sample. Hence, systematic sampling requires the units to be randomly ordered. Other than that, this technique has the same disadvantages as the simple random sampling. Stratified random sampling involves dividing the population into non-overlapping groups, known as strata, and then doing simple random sampling within each stratum. Stratification recognizes that important characteristics are captured and that our sample is a good representation of the population being studied. The general steps in creating a stratified random sample are as follows. Define the population. Choose the relevant stratification. List the population according to the chosen stratification. Calculate sample size. Calculate a proportionate stratification.
and using a simple random or systematic random sample, select your sample. For instance, we define our population as the entire clients in company ABC. We then divide the clients into three strata, Caucasian, African American and Hispanic American and list the population according to this stratification. Then we use simple random sampling to select respondents from each stratum while making sure that the sample size of each stratum is proportionate to the population size of the same stratum. Now let's take a look at the advantages of stratified random sampling. It requires a smaller sample than a simple random sampling, hence it is more feasible when the sampling frame is large. In this situation, it saves cost in terms of money and effort. It also recognizes the importance of the stratification criterion. For instance, in a multi-ethnic population, stratification by ethnicity is important to reflect the diversity of the inhabitants. It follows that this method ensures that elements within each stratum are studied. In the above example, every ethnic group will be represented in the sample. However, there are also disadvantages. A stratified random sample can only be carried out if a complete list of the population is available. It is not always easy to find a stratification criterion. Researcher subjectivity then creeps into the sampling process. It is also not useful in a situation when there are no homogeneous subgroups. Another source of bias is when data for different strata is not equally reliable. An example is stratification by population density of districts. It is highly likely that districts with low population density are in remote areas and hard to gain access. Cluster sampling is a probability sampling method where the researcher divides the population into smaller groups, known as clusters, and then randomly select among these clusters to form a sample. This method is often used to study large populations, particularly those that are widely and geographically dispersed. Researchers usually use pre-existing units, such as schools or cities, as their clusters. The units in each cluster are likely to be heterogeneous because they are assumed to be subsamples of the population. Simple random sampling for the whole population is difficult when it is dispersed across a wide geographic region and a lot of ground has to be covered geographically in order to get to each of the units sampled. So cluster sampling overcomes this problem. The general steps in creating a cluster random sample are as follows. Define population. Divide the population into clusters. Randomly select clusters to use a sample. Collect data from each cluster. There are primarily two methods to do so, one stage and two stage. In one stage cluster sampling, all elements in each selected cluster are sampled. In two stage cluster sampling, simple random sampling is applied within each cluster to select a subsample of elements in each cluster. Let's take a look at the advantages of cluster sampling. Cluster sampling is time and cost efficient, especially for samples that are widely and geographically spread and would be difficult to properly sample otherwise. Because cluster sampling uses randomization, if the population is clustered properly, your study will have high external validity because your sample will reflect the characteristics of the larger population. It is appropriate when the sampling frame is not known or is unreliable. Knowledge of the cluster size is also not needed as only sampling frame of clusters is needed. It is also an appropriate and feasible alternative when the elements are in locations far apart. However, these are the disadvantages. Even though it is probabilistic, it is impossible to tell the extent of bias. This is because most of the time, the sampling frame and hence population is uncertain. If your clusters are not a good mini representation of the population as a whole, then it is more difficult to rely on your sample to provide valid results. Apart from that, sample size may also be unpredictable. Among the ethical principles of primary data collection are as follows. No harm means that research participants, interviewers, as well as respondents should not come to harm because of their participation in the research. 
If one is researching human trafficking, for instance, even the disclosure of location of respondents, some of whom are illegals, can cause them to be caught. Informed consent means that the respondents must be informed of the purpose of the research and have the right to decide whether, based on the information given, to participate or not. Anonymity means not disclosing the identity of respondents. Many respondents will not cooperate unless this is assured, especially if the information they give is sensitive. Anonymity is needed to ensure no harm comes to the participant of the research. Justice refers to fairness to all participants. It means not taking advantage of respondents who are vulnerable, for instance, forcing response out of those unaware of their right to refuse to answer. So, which sampling method will you choose? As with any data collection method, the decision to choose which sampling method involves a lot of factors. They include cost, which includes administrative and time, accuracy of information, response rate, speed of response, control over respondents, number and depth of questions, as well as dispersion of respondents. You might be wondering, what can go wrong in data collection? Well, the most serious one is that after much effort and money, the observed information is incorrect and the results are invalid. So what can cause this error to occur? Here, it's important to note that error does not mean mistake or something wrong. It means that what is sampled is not representative of the population. There are two types of error, that is, sampling error and non-sampling error. Sampling error is the differences between the sample and the population that are due solely on the sample selected or the sampling method used. For instance, if a sample of 100 Malaysian men were found to be taller than 6 foot 3, it is clear that this would be a highly unrepresentative sample, leading to invalid conclusions. The more dangerous error is the less obvious sampling error that can go undetected. There are two basic causes of sampling error. One is by chance. This is the random error that occurs because of bad luck in the selection process, which may result in untypical choices. Unusual units in a population do exist, and there is always a possibility that an abnormally large number of them will be chosen. Sometimes, several units with extreme values or outliers may invalidate the results of the entire sample. The other is sampling bias. This is a systematic error, which is a tendency to favor the selection of units that have particular characteristics. Sampling bias is usually the result of a poor sampling plan. The most notable is the bias of non-response, when, for some reason, some units have no chance of appearing in the sample. One way to reduce sampling bias is to sample carefully, paying careful attention to the suitability or reliability of the sampling frame, appropriateness of sampling technique, and selection of units to study. Alternatively, one may increase the sample size, which reduces the weight of outliers. However, there is a trade-off between sample size and cost. A non-sampling error is an error that results solely from the manner in which the observations are made. Examples are inaccurate measurements due to malfunctioning instruments or poor procedures. For example, if people are asked to state their own weights themselves, no two answers will be of equal reliability. The people will have weighed themselves on different scales in various states of calibration. Non-sampling error can arise from the manner in which the response is elicited, the social status of the people surveyed and their beliefs and attitudes, the personal biases of the interviewer, and so on. Non-sampling error cannot be cured by increasing the sample size. In general, we distinguish between the following causes. Interviewer effect. Interviewers are responsible for asking the questions. No two people will do it in the same way. Their questioning and interpretation of responses are colored by their own views of things. The manner in which they ask questions can also lead to differences in responses. Respondent effect. Respondents have their own reasons for providing the responses they provide. They may distrust the interviewer, they may want to show their status, or they may simply be shy or they just don't like interviewers prying for information. Sometimes they refuse to respond. 
If the lies are superficially plausible, they may not be picked up at all, especially if the interviewer is just hired to get the questions answered. Social norms play a role in the attitudes of both interviewers and respondents. Lack of sensitivity to these norms can at best lead to distorted results, at worst to altercations or outright refusal to cooperate. For instance, sending a Malay interviewer to survey Indian squatters can arouse deep suspicion among the latter that the interviewer is a government official. In some conservative cultures, male interviewers may not be able to interview female respondents. Once the raw data are obtained, it is necessary to have them processed into a form that is ready to be analyzed. This requires the following steps. Editing. This is the process where data are reviewed to ensure that they recorded full and correct information. It involves asking questions like, are respondent remarks left out of the questionnaire? Are there inconsistencies between the information given? Are there missing data? Sometimes the interviewers skip questions with the intention of coming back to them later, but they never did. Are there falsifications? For instance, with respect to licensing or profits. It is important to get everything correct before coding is undertaken by someone unfamiliar with data background. Coding. This refers to how to represent the data numerically. Researcher needs to ensure the properties of exhaustiveness, mutual exclusivity, unidimensionality in the assignment of codes. This means deciding what to do with don't know and checking whether classifications are correct. Wrong coding can cause major errors. It is important to remember that coders do what they are told. They do not question the rules once these are set, so it is the responsibility of the researcher to ensure everything is in place. To sum up, data collection must aim for maximum accuracy and efficiency. No matter how sophisticated your analysis is, it is only as good as the quality of your data. Remember, garbage in, garbage out. Many errors are self-inflicted. These, especially sampling errors, we can control for. Sometimes even non-sampling errors may be corrected. Data collection involves conscious choices. Clearly, the larger the sample, the more representative it is, and the wider the coverage, the less the depth of coverage. Usually, the choice of the sample size and survey instrument is made on practical grounds, such as cost, availability of skilled interviewers, and location of subjects, among others.